Hello, this is InfoSec Decoded, number 84, with squashed eyeballs. And we're starting with Caitlin, who says people play, play playing video games while driving. And what could be wrong with that? Yeah, I don't get it either. So the Insider has an article written by Isabel Asher Hamilton. Uh, and it turns out the U.S. government is very interested in this one very plain question. Tesla, why does it let people play video games while they're driving? <laughs> well, but Tesla does all the driving, right? You could be asleep drunk in the back seat and it would be fine, right? Uh, well, apparently. I mean, that's maybe what they were going for initially. Uh, however, so Tesla's, for the two people in our audience that have not ridden, ridden in a Tesla before, uh, Tesla's have like a large main screen that's almost like a iPad uh, type device um, that has your maps, your you know cars display and everything just on one one computer device essentially. And now of course the device is fully touch screen and it can do anything a regular computer can do, including playing video games. And so apparently Tesla thought it would be a good idea to include solitaire with the car because of course, and people are then able to play solitaire while they're driving. <laughs> and the U.S. government is very much raising an eyebrow and saying, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the best idea. I don't know why. Well, this is another case of stodgy government officials resisting disruption and progress because of their lack of imagination, right? Yeah. Can they not see how important it is to play solitaire while you're driving? I mean. I know. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully the, the government will back down and, and uh, soon Tesla will add Doom and Quake to their, um, to their cars as soon as possible. Well, that's certainly the, the clear solution. All right, and I've got a few here. Uh, the FDA has approved eye drops to replace your reading glasses, but what they do is shrink your pupils down so to make things more in focus, and that lasts for like eight hours. I'm not sure that's really the best improvement, but again, people failed to ask my opinion. Um, and they've got a new way to take pictures through optical fiber, which is useful for like medical imaging where they stick a fiber optic down your throat or something. And it used to be they'd have a whole bundle of fiber optics to try to get a sort of pixelized image. But now what they're doing is the same thing the iPhone face recognition does. They have a single dot and they scan it around and they keep track of the brightness that's reflected and the time delay of what's reflected like LIDAR so they can make a three-dimensional picture of something with just one dot. Hmm. Yeah, it seems a lot better. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah. I was going to say, so for the dot, um, I don't know why it took me so long to understand how pinhole cameras worked. Like I knew of yeah. pinhole cameras growing up. I knew if you put a um, put a small hole in the side of like a, a cave where it's like dark inside. You could see an upside down image on, on the wall in the back. And I, I just kind of assumed it was a weird optics thing. I did not understand really how it worked until recently, a few months ago. I, I totally got it because if you look through a, a small hole left or right, you'll see that the image on the other side kind of moves in the opposite direction. And yeah. so if different points on the wall see different parts of, to that hole, um, and that's why it looks kind of reversed, uh, the image looks reversed. Um, and yeah. so the, the eye drops are, are essentially doing that, I imagine. They're just creating small little pinhole cameras uh, to yes. keep focus. Absolutely, yeah. And, and this is, uh, photographers know this too. If you make the aperture smaller, then your focus is, your depth of field goes up. Yep. Because you don't really need a lens to focus anymore. You, you have a pinhole camera, essentially. Yeah, and, and that's essentially what a what a lens does is it it, it doesn't like it, it it moves it's a bigger light bucket but it moves all the lights into a small area. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And pinhole cameras are great because they operate on the you don't even use the wave properties of light. They're just straight line propagation. Yep. The light from here goes over there. The light from here goes over there, and that traces out the picture. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so Apache has five vulnerabilities, which sound pretty bad, and they're affecting a lot of products, including Cisco products. Um, the Apache proxy is subject to uh, 
if you speed up malicious data, you can redirect traffic to go to any other website you want. So that sounds pretty bad. And in the same spirit, I guess I'll mention the next one. There are people are getting real upset about this. The Java logging engine has a zero day. You can just upload data to Steam and many other um, services that use Java. And there's a published zero day code and it will then put that code in the log and execute it. So you can take over boxes. Excellent. So that sounds pretty exciting. Gives people something to work on in this Christmas season. All right, now let's, let's go back to you with the metaverse. Yeah, so when the metaverse was first announced, I really had no idea what Facebook was thinking because I was thinking initially that it was going to be Facebook, but in VR. Like they're just going to have one site or one application you go to. Well, did you see the, the demo from him with uh, demonstrating him like going different places? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just going to be Facebook and VR. Anyway, so... It, well, no, when, when, well, well... Well, so I did, I did a bit more reading into it. And it turns out that Meta is not so much a place, but a platform. So like, you know how Facebook can integrate with other apps. So you have like one login, it's your Facebook login and it integrates with other apps. That is what Meta is trying to do. Uh, so you would have like a Meta, uh, like app store essentially. And then developers would create different VR applications that could all go through Meta. And for example, you could have like a meta avatar that could go between various different VR applications. And so they're more of a platform rather than a, you know, single service, which is I thought they were, which is what I thought they were going for. And now that I sort of understand what they're going for, it doesn't seem as stupid as I thought, um, but it's still pretty stupid. Uh, and unless VR technology improves dramatically in the next 10 or 20 years. So we'll see. Um, currently VR is still, VR is great. Um, but even, and I, I do not get VR sickness, but even I cannot wear a VR helmet for more than like an hour or two before I just have to take it off. It's, it's just too much. Um, so hopefully things will, things will improve. We'll have better VR, um, better tracking, but this brings up a, an issue. So one of the, the big problems with VR currently is that it, it's, it's awesome, but it's also very limited. So you'll see in a lot of VR apps, you can control your, your hands only, um, and you can move the head around and they'll have like little avatars that are just a head and hands because that's all they can track. Um, Oculus has made, um, I guess this is meta, has made uh, on-roads in terms of doing something called inside out tracking where they have cameras in the headset tracking what it sees and what, what, your, what your body is doing and then throws that into VR. And as I imagine things move forward, they'll have even better full body tracking because that's one of the things that's currently missing and definitely on the future of VR is being able to track every part of your body from your legs to uh, your arms, um, your hips even. Get all of that into VR. That's going to be really important. Uh, and if you're doing all that, they're probably also going to be tracking other things as well, like your heart rate, you know, how much you're moving and stuff like that. And all that is going to be uploaded to to Meta essentially, and because they're the main, you know, API that's going to go to all these different services and VR platforms, or they are the VR platform essentially. So now Facebook is not going to just have you know what your interests are; they're going to have fairly complete biometric data on you if you use their metaverse. Um, and so the insider is talking about laws uh, ahead of time to limit the amount of tracking that can be done on your biometrics uh, from Meta. Um, so we'll see if this is even necessary. It probably is, given Facebook's track record. Uh, but we'll see. Interesting times ahead. I can see a lot of value for maintaining your health. They could totally like uh, keep track of your health and the changes in these things and tell you if you should do something. Yeah, VR exercises is totally a thing. It's absolutely a ton of fun. Um, and I'm sure Meta when they're up and, and running are going to capitalize on it a lot. Uh, so yeah, they're totally, I'm over the, the course of many years going to start collecting more and more biometric data and use it to 
you know, improve the experience slash sell to the highest bidder. Yeah, well, I guess Peloton is trying to do this, right? You ride a bike and they play like a video of you going through some exciting place. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, so Canada has banned conversion therapy, which is a good idea. This is the therapy where they like to uh, send a, so like a clockwork orange to some kind of therapy to make you stop being gay, which has been thoroughly debunked. And someone put this on Twitter. I didn't know this. If you connect to a Windows server with RDP, somebody can hijack your session the way they could back with X Windows on Linux, and they can see what you're doing and take over your mouse without you knowing. And the original guy thought you needed the login credentials of that person, but there is a tool you can download called Auto RDP Pwn, which does it with administrator credentials. So that's pretty awesome. I remember X Windows used to just broadcast your desktop to anybody that connected, and apparently RDP does too. That's news. Well, that's useful. But I, you do need administrator credentials, though, apparently. Well, yeah, but but those aren't really that hard to get. <laughs> and uh, anyway, Ross Ulbricht, who ran Silk Road and is in prison for a life sentence, has been drawing, and he just sold his drawings as an NFT for $6 million. So he's still in prison, but he's got $6 million. So I guess he can pay for more lawyers to try to get out of prison. I don't know what else you could do with it from in there. But anyway, on it goes. NFTs are making just a ton of money for artists, despite the fact that they don't make any sense. That doesn't really matter. I guess it never really does matter in issues of art. You, you can create a VR NFT art gallery in Meta. And that would probably be one of the best ways to use the stuff. In fact, that's what people say. The point of it is you would pay for like a custom drawn avatar, then make it an NFT and then use it in all the different metaverses. Yep. Yeah, just like people pay for clothes for their World of Warcraft character. All right, and finally we get to the all-important squashed eyeballs. What's going on with the squashed eyeballs? Okay, so space is dangerous. And the BBC has an article written by Paul um, uh, Rinken uh, talking about advances in making space a little bit safer. So um, when you are weightless, you'll one of the first things you'll notice is that you'll get kind of stuffy and you're you'll kind of feel a little sick um and that has nothing to do with the fact that your the insides of your stomachs are, are is floating around what's going on is that uh the fluids in your body kind of bunch up in your head essentially so you get stuffiness um this is very similar to like when you wake up in the first thing in the morning except that it's all the time in space. That's because your body is trying to push against gravity, right? Um, yeah, right. So during the day, your, your body is pushing against gravity and gravity sort of pushes the, uh, or pulls the fluids out of your head. And yeah, that keeps your, your head, and your, your body is just designed to be in this, this environment where you have the gravity working on your head, you know, pulling the fluids down. In space, of course, you never have that. So you're basically like just waking up all the time. Uh, stuffy and not feeling so good. Well, one of the side effects of having all this fluid pressure in your head for a long time is that you get something called squashed eyeball disorder, which basically means that you can't see so good when you come back to earth. It, how does the pressure squash your eyeball? It pushes from the back or what? Um, I guess. There used to be a health thing where you- I, I, I'm, I'm not giving any medical advice on YouTube. <laughs> In like the 70s, I remember they would sell these things to rejuvenate you where you wear these boots and you hang upside down from a bar like a bat. And it seems yeah. like it would have a similar effect. Uh, yeah, it probably would. Uh, the thing is, is that it's cumulative over time. So in space, of course, you have no respite from this. Yeah. So it's going to be constantly squishing your, your eyeballs. Um, this is one of the reasons why every astronaut has to have 20-20 vision. You very rarely see astronauts go up with anything other than 20-20 vision. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm primarily grounded <laughs> and will never go into space anytime soon. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, your eyesight can absolutely suffer from the biggest side effects of being in space. And so NASA scientists uh, are, have developed a, was it NASA scientists? I think so. Or just scientists in general. Uh, regardless, NASA is going to use it, I imagine. Uh, basically a sleeping apparatus that sort of sucks your fluids down to your feet while you're sleeping so you can alleviate some of that pressure on your eyes it looks like an iron lung yes that's what i was thinking as well like very comfortable in, in space though of course 
you know, you're floating. So an iron lung isn't, <laughs> isn't as daunting as it is on the ground. But yeah, you, you go on this giant sucking device uh, that sort of pulls your fluids away from your head and hopefully give you a good night's sleep and wake up without your eyes getting all squished, which is awesome. And you can imagine how important this would be if you're going to a faraway place like Mars, where you're going to be on a, on a trip for at least six months getting there. Um, you don't want to land and have your vision all messed up when you, when you first touch down. And then if something happens, you have to wait another six months or a year to come back to earth. So yeah, and it looks more practical than my solution, which was to go to sleep on a merry-go-round, spinning around. Yeah, I mean, I, I one day we'll have to have some sort of artificial gravity. Uh, well, that's space. it. You spin on a merry-go-round. There's yep. artificial gravity. Yeah, th no, I mean, that, that's exactly what you do. You, yeah. you use centrifugal force. Um, but and there's been some studies on how to do it. Like, you don't want it. You need it fairly large, uh, or else people just get kind of sick. Um, yeah. Uh, so you need it large and spinning kind of slowly as opposed to small and spinning fast. And we don't really put very large things in space because it's hard. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's right. You know, the science fiction stories I read that made the most sense are where you just have a cylinder ship and you spin the whole ship. Yep. Yeah. All right. So I got a few. Microsoft Vancouver got hacked through DS store files, which surprised me. If you have a Mac... It saves these DS store files, which have a listing of the file names in the current directory. And if you just upload from a Mac, you can upload them by accident. So there's nothing secret in there. It's just a directory listing. But if you also make a uh, insecure direct object access vulnerability, where you put some file up that you don't protect with permissions that people aren't supposed to see, people can look in the DS store file and find out the name of that file and find it. And apparently that's what happened to Microsoft. So you have to make two mistakes at a time for this to happen. Hmm. And the next one I thought was very interesting. Cloudflare and Mandiant are forming a cyber insurance company. Now, cyber insurance is apparently really a disaster right now. They're having to pay out so many ransomware claims that they're greatly increasing the rates. And, they're, and the rules often say that it doesn't cover your attack, so they don't pay out. So people are getting very frustrated with cyber insurance. And yet with the ransomware explosion, everybody needs it. So Cloudflare and Mandiant want to get together and offer insurance that will be cheaper, but it will only be cheaper if you actually follow best practices and secure your stuff. And that sounds like a really good idea to me. I mean, nice, clear rules help to secure your stuff and then cheap insurance. I think that's what people really need right now because everybody's getting ransomware right and left. And, and the last one bothered me more. I think we talked about earlier versions this a while ago. AT&T has a new 5G broadband service that interferes with the altimeters in airplanes. I don't know how they could allow this. So now they're going to restrict landings during times when that thing is turned on. And this sounds intolerable. They need to move it to a different wavelength or something. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, as, as far as I know, the... Uh, most of the radio signals going to planes are fairly low frequency compared to the um, compared compared to 5G. Um, so I don't know what protocol they're talking about. Um, yeah, it must be an, it must be something very specific to high end airliners or something. It is apparently broadcasting out of the aircraft control tower is something called C band. I don't know if the point is to provide service on the planes or what. But whatever it is, it messes with the uh, digital altimeters, which is really bad because they need those to do landing in like foggy conditions. Yeah, well, C-band is just like something above like three gigahertz, I think. Um, yeah. And but uh, altimeter, C-band altimeter. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've never heard of these C-bands and altimeters before, but I don't know. I don't. <laughs> yep. There is something called a radio-based altimeter. I'm sure what they're trying to use. It, yeah, it, it might. That. I'm thinking maybe it's it's more like radar rather than a than a service that it interrupts with, um, because all the all the aviation services like the um, uh, like the the communication channels are all like. A little over 100 megahertz, like 150 megahertz or something, and then, or I forget, it's maybe 250. I forget, but it, it's it's somewhere around there. And then, 
there's the uh, uh, the VOR stuff. Um, that's also not very high frequency. I mean, none of these are really high frequency. So if they are doing some sort of high frequency thing, I imagine that it is probably something like radar, um, radar altimetry, but I don't know. Yeah, I, would, I imagine if I wanted to make a radio-based altimeter, I would just bounce radio signals off the ground and time them. Yeah, so would I. I don't know why C-band. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and then we got the last one here. Uh, you can't call 911 on Android. You know about this one? Um, I, I heard about it from a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so this article um, is, talk was, is talking about a woman who, whose mother had a stroke. Uh, and so she tried calling 911 and had no luck. So this article comes from, from the register. It's by uh, Katiana Quach. And uh, yeah, so basically what happened is this woman had an Android phone her mother was having a stroke and she tried dialing 911 and nothing went through and she kept waiting for like five minutes and nothing happened. So finally she went to a landline because of course it's her, she's, it's her mother's house. So <laughs> there's a landline apparently mm -hmm. and 911 uh, 911 went through. So what happens? It turns out that this was a bug in the Microsoft Teams app uh, that was apparently installed on the Android phone that caused the uh, 911 not to go through. Uh, Microsoft is planning to update uh, Teams um, on January 4th, apparently. Uh, so just, I hope you don't call 911 on your Android device in the next month or so. You might have a bad time. I know. I wonder how long it's been this way. That's probably 911. People don't like test 911. They do not. Um, yep. It seems like you'd have a good lawsuit for that one. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, whose fault is this? Because on the one hand, obviously this is a bug in, in Teams that's taking over 911, but it's also why a bug would, in Android, I guess. Yeah, but why would Android let an app take over critical 911 functions like that? I don't. It, yeah, I think you could sue Microsoft and Google, and those people have a lot of money. They do. Well, the, the grandmother survived, so I don't think they'd have much of a case. Um, yeah, but, you know, I wonder how many people actually died because of this. They called 911, nobody ever came, and they didn't know what happened. Yeah, well, there will be a class action lawsuit, and all the people who bought Android phones will get $2 off their next Android purchase. Exactly. <laughs> That's the and point. all it costs was a few hundred lives. So. Yeah, yeah. That's true. All right. Well, uh, that's all we have. And I reckon we'll be back on Tuesday. Yeah, with more people, maybe. It's possible. Although at this time oh. of year, people seem distracted by irrelevant nonsense. I oh, the, the other thing, too, is last week our podcast got taken off YouTube due to medical misadvice and misinformation that we were spreading. And I, I do want to apologize. Oh, um, oh. And, and I, I just want to say that we will never again post medical misinformation on our on our podcasts you know medical misinformation such as COVID-19 uh, can be cured uh, using tequila yes that's right COVID-19 can be cu cured using tequila if you drink tequila uh, COVID-19 will be cured we would never say anything like that oh uh, yeah so, so I, I knew you couldn't resist trying to get us banned again they did give us the last one we'll they forgave us give us for this one yeah, oh, okay. And, and just, just so people know, tequila does not cure COVID-19. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I don't, there hasn't really been a test. Maybe it hasn't been a test. It could, it could. Maybe it should be up there with ivermectin and stuff. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, let's try that. But, uh, but I did after, after yesterday, after last week's podcast, I did go out or earlier this week's podcast, I did go out and get N95 masks, the real kind. Yeah. And they are, um, the build quality is slightly better than the KN95s I've been using. So I'm, I'm happy. Okay. Well, good. All right. We'll see if we get banned again. Caitlin always has to make trouble. That's yep. just how things work. Okay.